So I'm David Wingfield, so I'm a general practitioner, and I've been working in Hammersmith since 1989. Um, it's not purgatory, I assure you. I absolutely love my job, and I'm delighted to be here today and uh, to have made this happen with Azim and Claire and others because I'd really like to excite you about the future of general practice and about what you can do with your career inside general practice. Things are changing and I just want to give, make a few remarks at the outset of, of this conference to give you a sense of what's happening and why. Um, general practice is a great job. In the UK, primary care is is considered to be one of the best examples in the whole world. And many studies have <coughs> shown this, and it's being promoted across the world. Indeed, in Imperial College, um, in October, there will be an international conference, again, looking at what others can learn from primary <coughs> care. And this is a repeated theme. We, have, uh, conti we offer continuity of care, one-to-one -one personal care, which is really second to none. We have fantastic IT systems, warts and all, but actually, compared with what's available elsewhere, they're brilliant. Um, we have a registration system and a way of linking in personally with individuals, which is very, very special and not to be lost at any cost. The problem is that it isn't all rosy. Um, we are very, very fragmented, and this is our fundamental problem that we need to deal with. In Hammersmith and Fulham alone, we have 200,000 patients, but 31 practices, which vary from 2,000 to 18,500 patients. But we're all over the place. We can't speak with one voice. Our organizations are too small to be effective business units. And when we try and offer all the services to all the patients, we just can't do it. We're too small, too subscale. Unfortunately, things are getting worse, not better. The NHS has a much bigger financial and organizational problem. We need to retain high quality care, but we need to do it at a contained cost across the whole NHS. So actually the big NHS agenda is to integrate health and social care, hospitals, primary care, mental health, social services. For us to have a voice in that as primary care general practice, we need to think quickly and act quickly to bring things together. So what's the answer? The answer is that we're trying to do this. I'm standing here today as chairman of the GP uh, Federation in Hammersmith and Fulham. Chris Adams is the chief executive. We'll be contributing during the day. And we represent the, an organization which contains all 31 practices. It's our first step to bringing all of this together. We talk to commissioners. We talk to educators, Henwell, which commissions um, all the education that you are benefiting from or have benefited from, and we talk to research organizations and others. We start to speak with one voice, and we're working at another level too. Practices, 31 separate practices, is also not going to work as an engine for service delivery. We're all trying to do the same things 31 times within complex regulatory arrangements. So we're now promoting discussions as are going on across the country to see how those practices can come together, how they can group together, merge formally big partnerships of 40,000, 50,000 patients, 20, 30 partners of one end of the spectrum, organizations which don't formally merge but which work ever closer together a sort of um, EU look-alike, but perhaps a deeper union than um, the EU is currently achieving. Um, but a model which actually puts um, more, more um, uniformity into the system. And it's uniformity on service level, quality. So our 31 practices operate at the same level, and it's a high level, and an efficiency level. So they're more cost-effective too. So those are my opening remarks, and my, my question really um, to you now, or um, to, to guide you, is, is what do you need to do, knowing that this is coming, that uh, the service is going to operate at a bigger level, 
the NHS is backing it with something called the Five Year Forward View. You may have heard of this. The Five Year Forward View is a document you can find online, published late last year, implemented, starting to roll out this year. We are starting to see this become reality. So where does that place you? Where does that place your career? So there are a few things which I will just flag up before I hand over to Claire. First thing is, remember your core skills. You've had excellent training. You're really good doctors. You come out of a system which has been tailor-made to give you good medical skills and excellent family physician skills, those of you who've gone that route. Um, keep those up to date and extend them just, and decide where your particular interest is. There will be those amongst you who want to specialise and we're showcasing a number of options for you today. There'll be those of you who want to be the family physician predominantly and become leaders in the generalist area of work and there will be openings for this. But you need to think about where your place really is and, and really drive your skills up a level and another level as time goes by. And this will involve further qualifications it will involve you um, understanding how you fit in with other organisations. We've got examples of that, as I say, during the day. The second point is that, remember, your working environment is going to change. In the context of what I said earlier, you'll be working in a bigger group. This may, be, may mean that you don't just work on one site anymore because your practice or your federation or your organisation, whatever it looks like, may have five or six or ten sites, and your specialization, let's say, might be really needed, but it'll op you'll need to operate from a hub, a multidisciplinary hub, where there are eight or ten who, let's say, offer diabetic care together, and you'll work as a multidisciplinary team there. Or it may be in an urgent care context, and we'll hear from Simon Douglas in a moment, where the team could be even bigger, but you could become um, a leader in that area. And the third thing I want to flag up is um, career ambition because many of you will, if, I'm, if we were talking 20 years ago about career ambition, it would, or even 10 years ago perhaps, it would have been, do you want to be a partner or not? Well, the conversation is more complicated than that now. The, complication, the, the conversation may well be about do you want to be a leader? And in what way do you want to lead? Do you want to lead clinically? Do you want to lead organizationally? Um, do you want to be an owner of the system, the problem? And there may be very, very large partnerships where partners will own the problem and carry the risk. You may be that kind of individual. We may be the kind of individual who'd like that level of responsibility, but in a clinical area. And I think we will see the emergence of consultant-like posts in general practice as time goes on with advanced qualifications and subspeciality development, those opportunities will open to you. So if I stop there, I'll hand over to Claire Etherington. You do. Do you have some slides? So can I just get to them? Yeah. While we find my slides, I'll start. I'm Claire Etherington. For those of you who don't know me, my fancy title is that I'm Head of Primary Care Education and Training for North West London. I'm a GP in Harrow. I've had a portfolio career ever since I started. When I, went to, when I started medical school in 1980, the dean of the medical school at his introduction said that he wasn't here to educate us, to teach us facts. He was here to teach us to teach ourselves for the next 40 years. And you know what? Nothing's changed. David's just sort of talked to us with passion a bit about what it's like being a GP. And I feel very lucky to have been a GP. At the time I was a GP, I've done lots of different things. If you look around the room from medical students here upwards, all of you have got the capacity to do different things. And in the free sessions that we've got, coffee and lunch, come and ask some of the grey-haired people what we do, because we probably all do different things. So the, 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 the head of primary care bit, 
I work for the LEPB, the Local Education and Training Board, which is a sub-branch, there are 13 sub-branches of Health Education England. Um, Health Education England was created a couple of years ago to deal with the education of the whole medical workforce. And if you look at the sort of priorities they've got for this year, nearly all of those are primary care. Primary care is at a sort of crossroads. We are incredibly important. Those of you who've already got to the point where you're sitting in general practice, you know that we are being deluged with patients coming out of hospitals. And we need to think about what our skills are, what, what we're going to do as our roles, and what, what we're going to be sharing with other health professionals and with other organisations such as social care. So I don't think we can teach you what career you're going to have, because we don't know what that career is going to be, but there are some things you can do. And so the first one is probably keeping up to date. When you're a medical student, when you're a junior doctor, you have systems that make sure you keep up to date. You then get chucked out into the world um, as a newly qualified GP, and suddenly it's down to you to keep up to date. Um, there's a couple of my ex-registrars in the room, and they'll know that I spend all of their training time saying, that would make a really good entry for your e-portfolio. And then when you're a qualified GP, there's a bit of thinking about, this will be a really good um, entry for my appraisal. I shove a pile of my stuff onto Evernote as I go along and then email it all to myself and chuck it into my appraisal at the end of the year. It's quite tough if you save it all until the week before your appraisal. If you're going to be working in northwest London, we have a responsible officer called Dr. Dave Finch. Um, there's a website that talks about what you'll need to produce for your appraisal. And if one of the things that comes out of today is that the people who are already working as independent doctors get some stuff put forward for their appraisal and I'll think we've achieved something. So what are you going to do once you're a newly qualified GP? I'm not sure that you can set off saying I'm going to be an academic GP, I'm going to be somebody with a clinical specialty, but what you can probably do in the first few years is focus on acquiring some transferable skills. There will be loads of opportunities and when you apply for things, you'll be applying for things with lots of other highly qualified doctors. So don't get disappointed if you don't get something the first time. Apply for things, ask for feedback, because if you don't get it the first time, if you then pick up that feedback, you'll learn for the next thing that you apply for. And most people who are doing different bits of careers as GPs have probably got to where they have by serendipity. In my career, I started off doing clinical stuff. I accidentally got into a bit of mentoring because I went on a course and was inspired by the person who was doing the mentoring. I even accidentally did an MA because I read an article in the BMJ about a course, applied to go on the course, and suddenly a couple of years later found myself doing an MA. There are so many things that you can add on. David's alluded to the fact that we'll probably be subspecializing in general practice. So we might be doing things like acute care or dealing with patients who have long-term conditions and complex care. It's really fairly obvious that we're going to be working in networks in some way. If you're a budding ophthalmologist or a budding women's health person um, getting yourself firm, formal qualifications as a GP with a special interest. But there's so many other things. Um, there are all sorts of routes through education. Northwest London couldn't be luckier than having Imperial in the middle of it. There are so many opportunities for research becoming an academic GP. Um, there are careers that didn't exist before. Um, GP trainees onwards get involved in, in regulations such as the CQC. Um, you can work for all sorts of different bodies. All of those acronyms will probably change in the next five years, but there's all sorts of management things available. And then the world's your oyster. <coughs> if you look at the, um, the, 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 the GP registrar journal, Innovate, that's written by people who are learning to be GPs. Write something for them. Write to the college and say, do you want us to write something? Get yourself going and you'll then, you can then often find that you can get things published in other, in, in other areas. Lots of books about being GP are written by ex-GP trainees because they're the people who know most about it. I guess a word of caution. 
People who go into medicine are very clever. You're the top 5% of the population. You got, you did, you did GCSEs, module A-levels, A worked your way through medical school. It's very easy just to collect diplomas. You will need some proof that you've got the skills that you've got, but actually general practice and the associated roles are hands-on thing. People are going to be looking just as much at what your experience is. And so don't sign yourself up for diplomas and courses without thinking about what you're going to get from it. So it's not what certificate I ha I've got, it's what have I learnt from that. It is a new, complicated world that you're going into. Um, and you're going to be busy and you're going to need to have a work-life balance. People who become doctors have particular personalities in the first place. We're all a bit perfectionist. We're all a bit neurotic. We're all a bit hard on ourselves. We'll all get patient feedback and we'll look at the 99 good comments and dismiss them and worry about the one thing that said that we were running late or that we weren't kind. So I've just put down a few areas where you can get support networks. And for those of you who are newly, newly qualified GP, first five, the RCGP protection for the first five years really recognises that you're very vulnerable at that point and join it. You all ought to be registered with a GP. Doctors make terrible patients. We have consultations in the corridor. We don't bother to go to the doctor until we're very sick. Get yourself registered with a GP. Most GP practices will try and accommodate a little bit your working hours. Go and have some preventative care. So thank you. Really enjoy the rest of the day. So I'm Samia Hassan, so I, I've organised this with everyone else. I want to say a really big thank you to all of you to, for being here. It's brilliant. And also to the speakers. Um, logistics... So we're in the Glenister, the, the fire exits are this way, so I feel like an air stewardess. Fire exits are this way and also that way. Ladies' toilets are on the first floor, so just out there, and the men's are downstairs. We'll be having coffee and lunch back out, back to where you did your registration. Um, and that's it, really. So with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker. Which one did you want? Yeah. The big one. Yeah. The one. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, at the back. Excellent. <clears throat> well, my name's Dr. Simon Douglas. I'm uh, currently the um, interim medical director, I've been told to say by my chief exec of uh, London Central and West uh, Unscheduled Care Collaborative. Um, I've been asked to come and talk to you today about a career in out of hours general practice and I have to say it's a real privilege uh, to be standing here and given that opportunity to talk to you and it's really nice to see such a large number of very happy smiling faces here and long may it continue. Um, I think one of the points that um, Claire made about serendipity, um, I got something to add to that, and that is if you say yes quite a lot in your career, you do find yourself uh, in all sorts of uh, interesting situations. If I could give you some advice, I'd say say yes, but add on the I'll think about it, which is something I haven't done very well over the years. Anyway, so um, when I first uh, started in, uh, as a trainee, as we were called in those days, way back in the early 90s, um, I did a, my first post-surgery review with my then trainer, who remains a very good friend to this day. He uh, sat me down, he said, uh, he said, well, Simon, he said, um, what do you think you did well in your surgery this morning? Well, I fell off my seat because that was the first time anyone had asked me in my up to then five-year career as a hospital doctor what I'd done well without concentrating on all the bad things. So I thought, well, I've made the right decision to, uh, to do general practice because that's how it carried on. And I'm very pleased to remain a GP to this day. Uh, and it was a very positive attitude towards learning and good feedback that actually made the, the, the experiences of registrar very, very good. So I'm not here to talk to you about being a uh, general practice during the daytime. So I won't be going over things like long partnership meetings. Um, 
that gentle chat about who's having Christmas week off this year. Uh, all that lovely pile of paperwork that you have at the end of each day. Or even how you might feel at the end of a day in general practice. So I know I'm going to talk to you about what it's like to work in out of hours. So David's already said about the amount of knowledge that you've all acquired over many years of hard graft. Um, and that's not just the years as a medical student, it's the years you've worked as junior doctors, but also in your registrar year. So you really do get to apply that knowledge, um, which is in vitally important in the out-of-hours environment. And equally important, you get to use all of those well-honed communication skills, which are absolutely crucial in out-of-hours, particularly when you're doing things like telephone consultations. It's a new type of skill something we all think we're good at, but actually it's something that a lot of us need to have specific training on. The other really important thing, and I think our previous speakers alluded to this, David particularly, is that in a world of super specialisation, in, particularly in the hospital sector, where the only real generalists left now are the ED specialists and the geriatricians, your generalist knowledge is actually a specialty in its own right. And because of the ever com complex, increasing complexity in the health service and the way we have to navigate, help navigate our patients through, your generalist knowledge is really important. And you need to um, acknowledge that and make sure that you continue to develop your wide range of skills. So what are the benefits in working in the out-of-hours environment? Primarily choice. So you get to choose when you work, where, and also how hard. And it's how hard you work that relates directly to how much income you get. Now the income as an out-of-hours GP is, is reasonable. You're not going to be super rich, but you'll certainly make enough to live quite comfortably off. And it is also directly related to how hard you work. Now if you ask most GP principals these days, they are seeming to work harder and harder for less and less. And I'm sure... Uh, David would agree with that. I certainly would, as a, being a GP partner over a period of 20 years. <coughs> There's a great sense of teamwork in our um, service. So if you're doing a t phone triage uh, session, you'll be working with several GP colleagues around you, um, supported by a really good um, supervisor who will make sure that you're not spending too much time talking about your next holiday. Um, you'll be working with emergency nurse practitioners, particularly in our urgent care centres, uh, paramedics. And if you're out on a, on a home visit session, you'll be accompanied by a driver. And our drivers are a great bunch of blokes. They're really keen and passionate about supporting GPs do their work. Uh, and they're, they're fond of all knowledge. They're very helpful in terms of helping you manage your, your home visits. And they'll even accompany GPs if you're going to a slightly less than salubrious neighbourhood uh, and you feel like you need a bit of help. Um, I usually say, if I'm not out in 10 minutes, come and get me. Um, we also offer senior clinical support. So people like me, uh, as medical director, we have an on-call rota. So if there is anything that's significant that kicks off during, during an, any out-of-hours uh, session, we can uh, be there on hand to provide support. Organisationally, we also work with other out-of-hours services, and um, we're a member of this uh, body called Urgent Care UK, UHUC, uh, and it's a group of about 30 or so out-of-hours services around England, um, who, uh, they're all social, we're all social interest, social, um, sorry, community interest companies, um, and we are, um, we meet fairly regularly at conferences with chief execs, directors of nursing, and um, medical directors, and we, we, we talk about all the sort of issues that are facing us, we have interesting presentations, and more importantly, we provide a very loud national voice uh, to make sure we're heard in the Department of Health around issues of uh, out-of-hours care. So there are a lot of opportunities, as you'll hear, I'm sure, throughout today, a lot of opportunities uh, in any career path that you should take as a general practitioner. But we have um, all of these here, teaching and education. Um, all of you, I'm sure, would have been trained in your out-of-hours skills uh, by an organisation similar to my one. We are very uh, hot on governance and quality. Uh, we just had a CQC visit 
uh, which was quite a tough day, I have to say, but we were well prepared for it and we're quite confident that we'll come through that okay. Well, we haven't heard anything from them for the last three months, so that's usually quite good news. Um, we do a lot of clinical audit and we have a number of roles within the organisation that we like GPs to, to take a lead on, such as safeguarding roles. And as David has said in terms of the complexity in his introduction, there's an enormous challenge around service redesign affecting all organisations in the community. So, leadership we've touched on and we're going to have a session later on this morning about it. If you look at all of those qualities of a leader um, on the uh, right there, I think you'll agree, I hope you agree, that all of you if all, have got pretty much all of those qualities in terms of what you do as a clinician. And we've already heard the term transferable skills. And I think a lot of clinicians do not appreciate the latent clinical, uh, clinical leadership abilities they have. And we certainly like to try and develop and bring out those skills in individuals. So we've got a number of leadership roles across our organization. Uh, and with more coming on stream as we grow and develop the services. So are there any downsides to working in out-of-hour services? Well, lack of continuity of care is often cited as being one of the problems. Uh, we've just uh, undertaken a project in the Ealing and Hounslow area where we provide some services, uh, a GP out-of-hour service, where we've now got System 1 access. So I was, <coughs> I was doing a shift uh, over the holiday weekend, uh, just gone, and um, I was doing a home visit. I had my laptop out patient I've never seen before, I had complete access to their GP record in their front sitting room. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and it really does help to offer a, another level of care and also help to make sensible, more, even more sensible clinical decisions, or at least I hope so. One of the disadvantages is that we don't really get any follow-up in terms of what the cases we've managed, unless, unfortunately, there's a complaint or a clinical incident which is a real shame because the vast majority of consultations that our GPs do are, very, are, of, are of a very high quality. But I think in terms of the continuity of care issue, I think with access to GP, daytime GP records, we are now able to offer an extension to the continuity of care that's, that's given to patients during the day. And in general practice today now, there's been such a shift in the demographics. We've got a lot more part-time working. Long-term condition management is now getting so complex that it's being handed over basically to multidisciplinary teams, with GPs absolutely holding the ring on it. But in terms of the day-to-day -day seeing of the patients day in, day out, I think that pattern, that paradigm is shifting. Um, it's still a really key role for GPs to play. We also have a much more consumerist society. If you do a shift in an urgent care centre, you'll see that in the certain age groups, maybe the 20 to 40 something. Um, I'm slightly out of that now, as you can probably tell. Um, where they don't really care who they see, they want to see a well-qualified GP who's confident and able to give them the diagnosis fairly quickly in a management plan. That's basically what people want now. And with modern technology, we can actually provide that service at scale right across the piece. Yes, well, um, our lovely defence organisations, uh, the cost of insuring uh, a GP out of hours is, is rising quite significantly. Um, our leader has taken a personal pledge to, to sort it out. Uh, is recognised that the increasing indemnity costs could undermine seven-day working in general practice, let alone the out-of-hours pressure, because uh, the defence organisations, in their wisdom, are now saying anything outside the Monday to Friday time period counts as urgent care. Um, we have been led to believe that by being able to share GP records, that that will result in a reduction in our costs. Um, a colleague of mine who's a, a medical director of the Midlands Out of Hours Service, uh, they've been running with System 1 for about 18 months and she assured me it has made a lot of difference to the fees that her GPs are paying. Yes, well the tax man's always uh, never misses an opportunity to try and challenge our self-employed status. Um, that is uh, happening at the moment. We recognise that all out of our services uh, would take a massive hit if uh, all GPs working for us were, were to become salaried. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, 
uh, all our costs would go up around about 30%, which would effectively bankrupt the out-of-hour services in England. Uh, and this is why we need organisations like UHUC to make sure that our voice is heard and the warnings are heard at the DH and HMRC. So the future. Those of you, I'm sure, would like to have, have read uh, Sir Bruce Keogh's uh, Urge and, and Emergency Care Review, uh, nice light bedtime reading. Um, he makes some very key points in the review that we are operating an amazingly complex urgent care system and it needs simplifying, needs to be more patient focused. Patients want a coordinated system. They don't really get this word integrated and they're not too interested in what it means. They just want uh, their, their, ex their experience of care to be as smooth and, and as, as possible. And also they're not really that bothered about who provides it. Um, they think that we're all part of the same NHS family, be it ambulance service, 111, or daytime general practice, you name it. They think we're all part of the same thing, which ostensibly we are. So this is the complexity we're facing in terms of uh, trying to pull this all together, and these are all the organisations that are involved in trying to knit together daytime and out-of-hours care. Uh, many of you would have heard of... Uh, whole systems integrated care, that's the sort of advanced care planning or sort of long-term condition care planning. It's really important that we have a really good crossover and an interface between what's happening for, for these patients in hours and then making sure that we carry on delivering that care, appropriate care in the out-of-hours environment. And then David in his uh, talk explained all the need for general practice to start thinking about shifting into larger organisations and not forgetting the really critical and crucial roles that social care and the third sector play. So, finally, uh, a, pl a plea. Um, you're here today about the role that you're all going to be taking in the future. You are the future of the health service. The health service is basically made up of people, um, and we're going to rely on you to carry on doing all the good work that's been done before you, so you can look after us when we need uh, long-term condition management. Um, and I would please ask you um, not to um, clear off to Amman and earn a shed load of uh, tax-free cash, because it won't make you happy. Um, you're much better <laughs> off staying here. So thank you for listening. And I totally echo that. You won't be happy if you go to Oman or Dubai. Um, and it'll only be a few years. That. Exactly, that you all, and it's just, so anyway, um, all my, not that anyone's gone, but. Um, so the next bit is, is moving on to um, urgent care careers. You've seen, you've seen what's available, what the experience is. Um, I, as a, when I came off the GP training scheme at St Mary's, I did a lot of urgent care work at LCW. LCW is a fantastic organisation. It's so supportive. I made such um, amazing contacts, and I just felt that as a young GP, uh, newly qualified GP, there was a lot of support there because there are lots of young GPs there, and and there were great opportunities to network. And oh, there's a job there. Oh, there's a job here, and it's you don't have to keep looking in the BMJ, and it's and you make and you make really good relationships with. With the with the old with the senior GPs or the older GPs like us lot, and it's and it's really nice. Um, and then you can decide, you know. And there's a lot of a lot of not gossip, but sort of you know, sort of oh right, that practice is brilliant, and this is great, and this is the opportunity there, and etc. And that's and that's really important, I think, as a young GP. So there is um, Henwell and um, Ruth Brown, ED consultants at Mary's, have. Um, have created an emergency medicine course for GPs. You may not have all got the email, especially the newer, the newer qualified GPs here. And it's an invitation to all GPs in Northwest London, whether you're, you know, five to ten years qualified or just coming off GP training schemes. And so it's a it's a six day training course over six months, and it's a fantastic opportunity to become a senior decision maker within A and E. As a GP, GPs, you know, we talked about um, actually ED, uh, emergency doctor, uh, 
being an ED consultant or working in urgent care, you know, you provide that sort of holistic care. Well, ED recognises actually that GPs are very important in in providing that care. So this course is really fantastic. I mean, I wish I could do it, but I just don't have the time. I really wish I did. So this email will be going out to you because we've got your details. So this will be going out to you tomorrow. Have a look at it. The, the deadline is the 29th of September. Um, but, you know, I would want to do it, seriously. Um, it is a commitment of six days. There is backfill, um, and it finishes in January. But this, the, um, the A&E at St Mary's with Ruth Brown's team is absolutely brilliant. It's so supportive, teaching, you'll learn so much. Um, it's just fantastic. So this will come out to you tomorrow. All right, so please do have a look at it. Um, a fantastic experience as well, which will support your careers in general practice as well. Okay, David, did you want to say something about? Uh... Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? If I speak? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then I'll just I'll just speak up. Then. There are a range of opportunities, and it's great that Samia did you send in um, this one opportunity out to you, which will start the training and lead on to possible work opportunities. That's what this day is about. It's, to, it's turning a review of an area ideas into actual practical things that you can do. Another thing which is coming through later in the autumn is that the Federation has been working again with Penwell on a, <coughs> a to, to design a, a job for a fellow in urgent care and we hope that this will also be coming um, together and the sort of thing this will involve is for example working with Simon at LCW across the in hours and out of hours problem which is very very complex and can't be solved in one piece but taking part of that problem and trying to address it so that you would be involved in effectively some in-depth project work on something which could be achieved in a 12 month time scale, for example, as well as working within the system. So watch out for that one more soon. And as uh, Tanya has uh, said, we've got all your details, so we know where you are, and uh, we'll, we'll be sending this around. Perhaps we can take any questions yeah. that we've got at this point, but maybe it's important. Actually, can you say who you are and where, which stage you're at? Because that would be really interesting. <laughs> then we can pitch the, the answers. Of course, yeah. Uh, my name's Samira. I'm a GP. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, Brilliant. Um, I'm going to start with the It's, yeah, so it's, it's both actually. So it's to be a senior decision maker. So you're, you're working alongside your colleagues in urgent care, but it will be to make those, it's almost a step between the GP, sort of UCC GP and, um, and the con not the consultant, but the senior registrars. So actually it's pitching it in the middle. So where, so you will be the, uh, you'll be sort of, ref cases will be referred to you if, if the juniors cannot make that decision or they feel that it's not. So you're a supportive clinician. So it, it is a leadership. It is actually providing that extra level of training. So after the six months, six yeah. days, then it leads on to the Absolutely. Exam. Oh, yes, yeah. Because I, I did get an answer from that. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. Any questions like that, you can email. You've, you will have our email, so you can direct that to us as well. Yeah. Any other questions? It's a very exciting course. Go ahead. Yeah. Of course. No. The out of hours. Um, Simon. You said that we've got systems one, and if it links up, um, it means that we've got everything there to see. How does that work with? I mean, most practices are different systems, and even as well, but do you still get the records? So, of so at, at the moment, we're running um, the system one project is just in Eden and Hounslow. Uh, the whole system integrated care, which covers the uh, three boroughs, 
um, in the northwest London big boroughs, they are pretty, pretty, all the advantages of that is predicated on system one. But at the moment, we use a system called Adastra uh, for the IFW well area, and we really want to push to go to system one. Fortunately, the vast majority of practices that my service covers are on system one. Um, now, I am led to believe that there is a solution somewhere in the ether around uh, integrating Enus Web, also that the system one can interrogate an Enus Web record, but don't hold me to that. I mean, that will obviously need to happen if you've got practices on Enus Web in your area um, that we're covering, and the system one can come up in the same level of care. And that's, uh, that, that would be for the commissioners to sort out because they must make sure that equal care and equality of care delivery across their population. So we'll, that's where we're pushing that button. Which so we need to cover Hammersmith and Fulham, Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster. Um, and that's where our GP out of hours, our core GP out of hours services, and we now operate, um, we cover about three quarters of the practices in Ely about uh, the third of the practices in Hounslow. And we're waiting for the other practices in the in Hounslow to decide to come on board with us or not. But all of the ACCGs in London appreciate that being able to access records if we're all going to be working together in networks or out of hours. So they, they can all see as part of their signing up to whole systems integrated care, they are working yeah. on this problem. Yeah. Any other questions? So, so I'd like to introduce you to Graham Easton. So, yeah. We're moving on to portfolio careers now. Okay, hi, C can you hear me all right, Matt? Yeah. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm Graham Easton, and I'm a, a portfolio GP, I guess. I, I was just thinking that. Um, when I was in medical school, I, I did struggle at medical school. I wasn't, I wasn't very good at neuroanatomy, and I kept failing it. Um, and it all seemed a bit like a sort of telephone exchange uh, memory exercise. But, um, and I couldn't really see, to be honest, uh, that I, there was a career in medicine for me. Um, and I went to my dean, and I said, I, I'd quite like to give up and go and read zoology after one year. Um, cut a long story short, I think a portfolio career in general practice um, was my saviour. Um, I'm now passionate about general practice. It felt like coming home when I chose general practice. And a portfolio career for me has meant that I've been able to pursue all the different interests that I, that I had as a student. I wasn't really a one-track guy. Um, I, I could not believe my luck, really, looking back now at what, it's been able to, what I've been able to do in, in a career in general practice. So, Samir so and I are just going to talk for about half an hour, um, I think, uh, about this idea of portfolios. Um, roughly, what I'm going to talk about for the next quarter of an hour is what, what's a portfolio career, how, how you might develop one, um, a, a brief uh, look at what my, my career is like at the moment, some of the benefits and the problems, I'll be as honest as I can, and then maybe there'll be time for Q&A as well. So... Um, what is a portfolio career? So this guy, Charles Handy, in the late 1980s, was the person, he's a sort of business guru, management consultant, who, who sort of coined the phrase portfolio career. And he was predicting that in years to come, workers will want to take much more active control of their careers, and they'll probably plump for lots of small jobs rather than one. And he didn't say anything particular about medicine. But actually, as it happens, um, it, it has become much more popular in medicine, the idea of a portfolio career of small jobs, um, possibly out of choice because people want to work that way, occasionally through necessity um, because people can't get uh, full-time work. But what is it? And I, I'm actually talking to all the people earlier, a lot of the speakers here. I mean, everyone to some extent is a portfolio GP uh, in general practice. Uh, whether you're a partner, I and mean, Claire Gerarda was talking here a few, a few months ago, and she was saying actually a full-time partner on average works about six clinical sessions. I know people do more or less, but actually they, they have a lot of other activities in their working week. So um, there are a lot, there's lots of diversity whatever path you take in general practice. But I suppose what I'm talking about is a slightly more um, rigid uh, definition of portfolio, which means lots of part-time jobs, 
instead of a traditional job for life with one employer, perhaps lots of um, part-time freelancing, some self-employment, and then combining to make a week, which is really lots of different separate jobs. Um, they're also called slashers, I've discovered. We are called slashers because it's, I do a bit of GP slash teaching slash appraiser. <laughs> and um, so I'm a slasher. Um, and you could argue that we're sort of slashing the old, uh, you know, one job for life model as well. Um, it probably, you know, the move towards portfolio working probably reflects this um, from the, from the um, Center for Workforce Intelligence. Fewer and fewer partners, blue line at the top. Uh, more and more salaried, locum, other type GPs who are often quite part-time. The workforce is changing. It's changed over the last 10 years. Um, when I was, I, I used to have a job as an editor of BMJ Careers, career, the Career Focus magazine. And I remember around the early 2000s, uh, people talking about this idea of a portfolio career. And I thought, that sound, that's a bit odd. But um, it's mainstream now. It's mainstream, I would say. So my, my, my week, these are all taken last week. Um, uh, so, so at the heart of it all is general practice for me, and I think for most portfolio GPs. That's, that's, the, um, that's the root, that's the spine of it all. I don't do much anymore, clinical work. I've found a balance that suits me, and I used to feel guilty about it. Um, I don't. I think I might have given up if I hadn't found this balance of working. I work one day as a salaried doctor, sometimes more doing other locum jobs and so on, topping it up. Um, for me, that's perfect. I love it. Absolutely love that day. Um, I have some interaction with our registrars, and Tim's here. Uh, I, I love all that. Uh, I used to be a partner and a salary doctor, more sessions than that, but that's where I've ended up. One day a week now, I work um, as, the as a program director with Samir and Martin here on, on GP Training Scheme. But for the last 10, 10 or so years, I've been working in the undergraduate department, doing some research, doing teaching. Um, I've loved that role. And I was thinking, mainly because of the portfolio aspect of my career, I, I've been able to, it's not just sitting in that office, it's been, you know, the top left was, uh, this is um, a, a, being an external examiner in Cyprus for a master's course in family medicine, a couple of trips to China teaching GPs about consultation skills. That, that's a normal setup, by the way, in China, where you have people waiting in the room with you. Nothing to do with the, with the patient. And that, and that there's a window onto the street, so to, um, no confidentiality at all. Um, I'm helping to, to develop a, a school of public health in Mauritius, part of the WHO, part of it. Uh, and this is the Singapore uh, Medical School, which Imperial is developing. So all those parts have been possible, I think, um, uh, an amazing um, opportunity because of a portfolio career. Um, for three days a week at the moment, I spend my time in, in this, which is my garden office. Um, spending quality time with my dog. And I'm mainly writing, at the moment I'm writing a book about general practice for a non-medical audience. I had an advance from a publisher and that's what I'm doing for the next three months. Um, or I'm preparing for media work. I work for BBC Science Radio. I used to be a producer there and a presenter full time. Now I do it part time, uh, maybe once a month presenting or being a guest on their global health program on World Service, sometimes on Radio 4. So that was a genuine uh, week for me, and uh, fascinating, keeps my interest up. But of course, everyone, uh, we've already heard of all the possibilities. I mean, general practice in many ways is like a, an amazing career passport. The, the things you could end up doing, if you see this as a kind of menu, um, the top I've sort of said, well, this is sort of clinical, medical. We're, we're talking about gypsies later on. We've talked about out of hours already, urgent care. Um, private GP services, humanitarian work. One of the doctors in our, in our practice went out to, to help with the Ebola crisis and is doing more um, tropical medicine. Then there's the non-clinical medical stuff like being an appraiser. I found that absolutely fascinating, by the way. Um, medical politics increasingly, CCG work and so on. Undergraduate teaching, research, being a trainer, the legal side of medicine. And for me, it was medical journalism. But there's a whole load, and I'm sure I've missed lots out. And then finally, non-medical things. As everyone said, GPs have transferable skills. And I'm always shocked when you hear people say, oh, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't, if I didn't do this. You know, what else could I do? And we've all got so many skills, so broad. Um, I know lots of GPs who are doing business things, entrepreneurial enterprises, voluntary services. There are lots of GPs in politics. Um, 
so I can only really talk about myself uh, in terms of how to develop a portfolio, but I suspect um, what's important, I think, is to be a little bit proactive about it. So one, a lot of serendipity comes into it, as Claire was saying, and I, I feel like it's slightly sort of moving from one thing to the other, but what was at the heart of it was what interested me. And you know, working out your values and what you want to do and what really interests you as your, as your ideal week. And thinking about what skills and training you have, what experience you have. Um, I think a good exercise is to, is to think actively, what would my ideal working week be like? Be, be a bit um, bold and risky and courageous. Um, think outside the box. Um, for me, training or work experience was the key, and, and, and in, if you like, I sort of went in one direction and then kept bits of it. There's a guy called Kevin Fong, who's an anaesthetist, he works for the BBC as well, and I saw an article by him, and he said it was a bit like being on a bungee string, bungee rope, and every now and again he'd go out and try something new, and it, every, he'd bounce back into his career with a little bit of that, and he'd keep it in his pocket, and, and uh, that's how he developed a sort of portfolio career. Um, for me, the training... After GP training, I did a master's in, in uh, science communication here at Imperial. I've become fascinated by communication skills and general practice training, writing and so on, did a bit of that. And that master's launched me into a job at the BBC and all the rest of it. So sometimes these things with work experience can make a big difference. Um, I would definitely trial things first. If you're going freelance and self-employed, um, you have to think about the, the, you know, the money side of things a bit and, and the practicalities. Um, so what I found helpful is this ability to actually um, have general practice as a stable spine um, and, and just uh, seeing whether you can make an income out of some of these other streams perhaps. And I definitely recommend the idea of a career coach or mentor of some type, either a formal one. And the great thing is as trainees, I think you're entitled to a London Deanery mentory, mentoring scheme. Yes, you are. Through the whole, of the Through the whole thing, isn't it? And you can have a very quick dip in or something a bit Yeah, that was, I mean, I, had, I tried this because I think if you're an educationist, you can also be part of that mentoring. And my mentor was a psychiatrist, but he, he, he was very happy to talk about journalism and all the other things. So, yeah, very, very important to have a mentor, I think, if you're trying this. Um, quickly, the benefits. Um, I would say these from my angle, and I looked at some other sort of bits of writing about uh, portfolios. For me, it's the flexibility um, to, to be able to... to to suddenly go on a trip, to take on a project. Um, it means I'm in control. I do have autonomy, and I quite like that. I don't like the feeling of not being able to, to decide what I'm doing so much, and, and that's been a great thing. Security, although there's a flip side, there is some security in having, um, not putting all your eggs in one basket. And uh, if, for instance, my BBC job packs up, which it could at any time, I've got three others. Um, the creativity side, for me, was a big thing. I, I felt that that part of my brain was shriveling when I just focused on medicine. That's a personal thing. And this has allowed me to, to, to maintain those skills and interests on that side. There is evidence that actually um, variety in your job can help prevent burnout. Um, that's, I, I think I, at times during my career when I was trying to be just one thing, for me, uh, I was heading towards that. Um, so that's helped me a lot. Work-life balance is obviously a big attraction, um, and uh, for me, I, you know, I've, I haven't had to miss anything school-wise. You know, I've been to all the sports days and more, um, and that's been a lovely thing. Um, and the other ex thing is the excitement and, and possibilities of, a, of the cross-fertilization of different roles. So my journalism informs my medicine, my medicine informs my journalism. The research I do here and the teaching is all, it all feeds into one big thing for me. I think that's quite important to think about how, how your different elements might play into each other. There are downsides. Um, I think it's, there is a huge amount of unpredictability. Um, you might have to suddenly drop quite a lot of things. Can you, can you go to Mauritius? Uh, you know, it's not, um, or can you take on this project? Um, uh, you might not have locums lined up for some months. And that means that there can be some financial uncertainty as well. Although I would say it's pretty relative. Um, my dad, who was a doctor, and he, he would have found, well, he did find this shocking, actually, that the idea that I might not do full-time general practice and be a partner. Um, that he would have definitely found it all a bit odd, but one bit of advice that he, you know, and he said, do, uh, do you finish your GP training, be it, get all that, and you can always have that. And that's so true. It's been, 
Um, we are so lucky to have that, and in general practice, you can, you can up or down the amount of clinical work you're doing. It, extraordinary um, flexibility, that. Um, my pensions are weak, hopeless. They're not as good as all my friends who've stuck with one thing. Um, the, the parts often add up to more than a whole. I think everyone who does sort of portfolio work acknowledges that that's a risk. Um, I have one day a week on the GP training scheme, for example, but if, if something comes up on the day I'm not here, you know, I can't ignore it. Um, so often things add up to more than the whole. There are clashes between roles. Uh, all the BBC work I do happens on a Wednesday, which is exactly the same day as all the GP training scheme work. Um, luckily, I have sort of a, um, uh, kind and generous bosses, but it can be a problem. I think for me, the dilution of the main clinical role can be an issue, and at one session or one day a week, um, you've got to worry about how you're keeping up to date. And keeping up to date takes no less time because you're part-time. I still have to do the same number of uh, hours of CPD. I still have to be up to date on, on all the things that I might see. Um, and then there's a bit about status and peer criticism. I'm not sure this is a big issue, but there is something about being the guy who, who turns up for one day a week um, in every job you do. Um, you know, so, so you know, will you ever uh, have that kind of status if you're into status? Um, you know, worth considering. I love this. This was uh, in reply to a Pulse article about portfolio careers. Portfolio GP is the new politically correct term for those lazy GPs who can't be bothered to do a proper full-time job. You should all have doctors stripped from your name. And um, part, of me, part of me feels alert. It's my dad. It's my dad. Back from the grave. Um, I don't always take anonymous posts very, you know, with a pinch of salt, I think, but... Uh, a, not lazy. I work far harder than I would <laughs> uh, doing lots of different jobs. Um, and I think, you know, people who write that perhaps maybe ought to look at their own job satisfaction. What do you think? Is he happy? Um, this is, I'm nearly finished, but this is a, an analogy to, to sort of, um, I think, to try and express one of the, one of the risks, um, which is, I couldn't find one which actually did it properly, but you get the idea. You can do lots of drilling um, in lots of places which never actually go deep enough to get the water if you're a portfolio GP. Um, whereas if you just concentrated on one hole and drilled it deep and deep and deep, um, you might struck, strike oil or water or whatever you're trying, trying to strike. And that strikes me as an interesting thought. Sometimes it can feel a bit like that if you're not careful. You spread yourself a bit too thin. However, I think um, it's fantastic, it's exciting. It feels a little bit um, daunting to start with as you're about to step off, but my experience has been that it's far less scary than it might, it might seem, and I'd recommend it to you if it's the sort of thing that, that, uh, that appeals. Samia. Any questions for Graham? No, you're all done found it. Okay, it's fine. Just, I'll get onto my bit now. Escape. I can find mine. I mean, it's such a fantastic thing to be a GP. It really is. Uh, Mona, where's the... I can't find... I can't find my own presentation. <laughs> Second, can I just check? Just check. Oh, I did it last night. Can you see another one? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah, no, 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 that's on your command. So, yeah, but I can't see them. This one? Okay, it's much nicer. And then, uh, oh, yeah. Are you trying to get a slideshow? That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Right. So. Okay, so we, we, we've got...
got a coffee break at 11, so I'll try and keep on time. Um, so I'm, I'm Samia Hassan. I'm one of the programme directors um, at the Imperial GP Training Scheme. But as we go through this, you'll see that you know, I, just, I do that for one day a week. So, um, but do lots of different things. Um, I really enjoyed medical school. I, even before coming to medical school, I knew that I wanted to become a GP. I just knew it. Um, I've got quite a few family members in medicine, in fact, probably half of them. So I always, I was just, I just, I was always interested in, in medicine. And I remember going to see um, my own GP and talking to her about the career in general practice and just thinking, actually, this is just, this is exactly what I wanted to do. So when I came into medical school, it was, right, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to do general practice. It wasn't about doing anything else. So really passionate about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to get out of medical school. And it was really about building the relationships with patients and people. Um, and that's what general practice allows you to do. But as I progressed through my career, realized how, actually how much flexibility it provides. Um, so I trained here. I actually sat in this lecture theater. So to be here is just, you know, it's just amazing. You'd never think, as a medical student, when you sit at the back, you think, my God, those people at the front are really clever. But we're not really. Um, we're just, well, we're not really. We're just, it's just progressing and getting a bit older and grey hairs. I did my GP training scheme at Mary's. Um, so a real true imperial girl, really. Um, thereafter, um, a bit more interesting, I have worked as a GP locum, salary GP, and as a partner. I've done it all. Um, and it's been an absolutely brilliant experience. Um, my past roles, I've always loved IT. I've got a twin brother who went off, when I came to medical school, he went off to do computer science with maths um, at university. And, and, and being a twin, I suppose, you know, having a twin brother, we were always very geeky together. And um, so what I decided to do when I came to the end of my GP training scheme, I really wanted to do something different. Um, and I talked about, I looked at careers in, in general practice with IT, but in those days, back in 2000, um, there wasn't much going on in GP and IT. So, and it was, it was amazing. I, I spoke to my father, and my father said, no, you've got to stay in medicine. And, I said, but, and he said, you know, at least you finished, but you can do what you want, but you finished, so it's up to you. Um, so there was an advert in, on the radio, it was so random, and I think my career's been really quite random. Um, and I just heard this and I thought, and I, my ears pricked up and I thought, God, this is something that I could really do. So I applied for it. It was, it was at Barclays Capital, which is an investment bank, investment banking arm of um, Barclays um, in Canary Wharf. So I thought, well, I'll have a go, you know. And that's what, as a, as a doctor, as a GP, I thought, well, I'll have a go and I can always come back to GP. Um, and th there was seriously nothing in IT apart from being a data con entry con um, person doing read codes. So I went for this role and thinking that, you know, it will just be, of course they won't want me. But there were two other doctors, two, uh, there was a surgeon who was, um, uh, who was applying and there was also an anaesthetist. Um, so I sat there with them thinking, what the hell are we doing here? What are we doing here? We're, you know, we're, we're medics. But actually... Um, I got through the interview, went through the second round, and and then got offered the job. And I thought, oh my God, what am I supposed to do now? You know. So I thought, okay, I'll have a go. I'll trial it. So I stayed there for two years um, in Canary Wharf, and it was just the best experience. It was just brilliant. The the skills that I gained, it was IT. Um, I learned how to program. I learned business skills. I travelled. Um, they wanted me to go off and, do, you know, do an MBA, and I thought, whoa, you know, I've just come out of, I've just done my MRCGP. I need a break. Um, so it was just fascinating. But what I didn't realise, and nothing's ever been planned, was that actually those skills that I learnt there, they were business skills. As a GP, you need business skills. You need IT, medicine, and IT go hand in hand together. We've talked about whole systems integrated care about joining up records, et cetera, et cetera. So it was just, it was very, I, I just feel very fortunate and lucky. But one thing I did miss was the patient contact. 
and there was no doubt about that. Two years of brilliant experience being a, a real city girl, it was fantastic when I was younger. But actually what I really missed was the, was the patients and the patient contact. So, you know, they, they, offered, they were saying, right, you know, Barclays Capital said to me, right, you know, we'd like you to go off and do this and head this and this. And I thought, my God, but I'm only a, a, a you know, I'm only a, I've only just qualified, but the skills are really transferable. You know, as, as a GP, your skills, the communication skills, what you've done, perseverance, the hard working, the commitment, they see all of that. And across very many different sectors, not just in banking or IT, those skills are really important. So the skills that you will acquire through your GP training scheme will allow you to do whatever you want to do. Um, and be equipped for general practice, obviously. But it, general practice is not just about seeing patients. It's about you'll be self-employed or you'll be a partner. So it's about understanding, actually, some business aspects of it and running your own business. Um, and as a GP, you are. We're all entrepreneurs. I'm sure, you know, as a federation, I mean, I always see David Wingfield as a, as a serious entrepreneur. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> So, you know, and so um, that led me back into, I thought, okay, after two years, I thought, right, I really need to make a decision. Do I stay there in banking and IT or do I come back? And there was, it was a no-brainer. I just missed the clinical contacts I came back into, into um, GP. And it was really easy to come back into it. I worked in the urgent care centres at LCW, um, made contacts through there, then became a salaried GP, became a locum. Um, and then through that, bringing those skills, in the IT skills and the business skills, um, I got approached to become a lead for the National Programme for IT, which no longer exists, but it was very good at the time. I've had executive, that allowed me to have executive roles in IT and on um, health committees, on the, on the um, professional executive committee, wherever I've worked, etc. Um, and I felt more confident being able to do that, having those skills, because I don't think I would have been able, I wouldn't have felt confident enough to do that had I not done that. Um, so my current roles, I'm a GP partner, and, and like Graham said, and everyone says, the backbone of what I'm really passionate about is being a GP. It's just the most incredible thing um, of being responsible, of being being a part, not just a partner, but being at a practice which is really deprived, it's got a mixed population, you're never bored. You don't know what's going to come through the door. And it's, you can make a difference, and you do make a difference. You really do. Um, you know, that old cliche, I can't, you know, doctors do, don't make a difference. I, I really believe that we can, and it's the small things that happen um, that you can really make a difference. And it's really rewarding when your patient comes back to you and says, you know, they don't even need to come back and say thank you. You know just by that rapport what you've done for them in those ten, those magic ten minutes. Um, and it's fantastic, and I'm sure you'll all agree that that's what happens. I mean, we do create magic in that, in that ten minutes, and we're so highly skilled. And there is no other profession that allows you to do so much in ten minutes, and, and we have got the best communication skills across the whole of the specialities, um, I believe, and I'm sure... Okay, we'll back me up. Um, <laughs> uh, so, we, so I work in a very um, a large purpose-built health centre. We're very lucky. We've just moved into a brilliant new health centre, integrated model of working. Um, we've just uh, won the contract for um, extended opening hours, which, again, I'm really passionate about uh, allowing patients to have access to the to the play, to the care they need at the right time at the right place with the right person so um, very very lucky that that's happening so those are my current clinical roles I've got an academic role so I run the program director uh, I run the GP training scheme here at April which is extremely fun I can see all our trainees there yes um, and it's just fantastic it's just a brilliant um, um, privilege to be part of, of you know a, a, of a training scheme of all the, you know, the Mary's and the Riverside and all of the North West London schemes will be working collaboratively together and that's one of our main aims. Uh, and so, you know, the inner North West London work uh, are working together much more closely but our vision is that we will work as a North West London to share, you know, um, expertise, to share 
uh, training and, and teaching, and, and we've got fantastic ideas which you know we're in, we're talking to Claire about, and with, um, hopefully with Tony there. So uh, all ideas to become research hubs and training hubs, um, and that's all coming later. But this is a brilliant role. I do undergraduate teaching not so much now because there's a lot of stuff going on in, in um, postgraduate training. Commissioning, so I was co-opted onto the Hamilton Fulham CCG board member, said no twice, but um, um, <laughs> finally got forced into it. But it's been fantastic, it's been really good. Um, it allows you to understand the NHS, it allows you to have experience in management, it allows you to run projects that you would never think of, audits, um, all sorts of stuff. And look at actually what's what's there for your and what's right for your population. So to be in, in control on a much wider level than just at practice level. Um, and so you know, I never had it in my head when I became a GP that I'd do commissioning. It's just it's just happened. Um, and sometimes you do you know, the more you say yes, you trial it. And if it doesn't, if you don't enjoy it, you can always set, you can always just you know come off and say right, I've done that for six months not my cup of tea, but actually I've learnt so much and I can bring that back to my practice and it informs other parts of your, of your roles. I have a, um, a strategic leadership role. Um, Imperial College Health Partners is the overarching... A, um, uh, the, well, they're an umbrella organisation which forms the AHSN Acad Academic Health Science Network across all of the um, services, all of the providers across North West London. Quite a new organisation. But again, very strategic. I go to St. I work in Victoria on a Tuesday. Um, it's fantastic I'm doing this. Um, I'm C2C clinical lead, which is a consent to contact project. Again, you know, amazing. And um, it's it's you know, 18 months into it. We'll probably be rolling it out in about in the next six months. And it's trying to increase the amount of people, patients, people um, being recruited into research. And it's also an exposure to different organisations of the NHS. I never realised, even as a GP of 12 years, how many different organisations there are within the NHS. You've got so many research, you've got so many organisations. It's just, it allows you to learn while you're on the job. So it's fantastic. And you meet amazing people. You really do. Um, future. Um, so I also, I also have a research role, which is not on here, the side must have been missed out. But, um, so I'm primary care lead um, for primary care research lead for primary care, which again is fantastic. Never thought, I thought research was for really, really brainy people. Um, and it's, you know, it's, but that is just allowing uh, to facilitate research in primary care to get more GPs and GP trainees to try and increase the amount of research we do in primary care because actually a lot of the work that's being done in hospitals is moving out into community so <coughs> patients are in the community that can be recruited in research. So what does, what does the future hold? Claire said the world is your oyster. It really is. Um, it really, as a GP, there's just so much flexibility for me, you know, I want to continue my roles because I'm really, I'm, I just, but most importantly, I was a hardcore GP for the first 10 years, seven to 10 years, seven years, full-time GP really consolidated my, my skills, my experience as a GP, so if you could throw anything at me clinically and I would be able to deal with it, but I, I know, I can understand now, nobody can do 10 sessions now, I mean, you, nobody can do that, even in hospitals. As a consultant, you do really six six PAs in clinic as a clinician you do two PAs one PA is a research one PA is a, a, a PA is a session one PA as a, um, um, a supervision so really there, it's no different from what our hospital consultants colleagues do so you know doing six sessions as a full-time GP it's no different from being a consultant <coughs> their work the workload so for the moment I'm going to continue my roles because I'm really enjoying them. And they do assimilate, they do inform another role. You know, um, it was just through the programme director role that David actually said to me, why don't you, why don't you do some uh, education for the Federation? So this is what led to this role. So, um, so opportunities, huge amount of opportunities. I mean, because of my background, I, I'm doing an MSc in health informatics. Um, 
at UCL. So that's part time, it's all virtual learning, just two days every module, every term, and that's fantastic. So it allows me to do that, allows me to be flexible, um, accommodate that. Um, I want to facilitate models of integrated care because I think that's where the future is. Um, we're looking at social prescription models of care. We talked about um, the, the social and the health uh, uh, budgets coming together. So social prescription models of care, very topical. And again, that's, that's a huge new dynamics in, in primary care and the NHS. It's not just primary care, it's the whole NHS really. So it just keeps evolving. You never stop, which is great. Um, 